Hi, and thank you for joining our educational webinar with Dr. Taylor Haidt. Hi, <laughs> and thank you for joining our educational webinar with Dr. Taylor Haidt, who will discuss the types of stroke and the importance of early diagnosis and treatment to improve patient outcomes. I'm Pauline Jankowski, BCU Health Poly Heart Center Marketing Communications Manager. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to first make note that we will hold all questions until the end. Please feel free to drop any questions you may have in the Facebook comments section throughout the event, and we will address them in the Q during the Q&A portion. Now, a bit about our speaker. Dr. Taylor Haight is a neurologist at our VCU Health Comprehensive Stroke Center, which provides leading edge care to both routine and complex care, complex stroke patients, including wide ranging rehabilitative services for any physical effects from stroke. Dr. Haight earned her medical degree at the University of Virginia, followed by an internship at the University of Virginia Health System. She completed a residency and her fellowship at John Hopkins University. Thank you, Dr. Haight, for joining us today. I will now turn the show over to you. Okay, thank you, Pauline, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, so I'll just go over a couple key points that I'd like to make during our talk today. So the first is that stroke is common. Stroke can be treated and stroke can be prevented as well. Now stroke is not a single disease, but represents a diverse group of conditions. And while it's true that not all strokes are treatable and not all strokes are necessarily preventable, it's still important to talk about how to recognize stroke so that we have the best chance of treating it and how to take care of ourselves to lower our risk of having a stroke as much as we can. So a little statistics for you. How big is this problem really? So this is according to data from the American Heart Association. So almost 800,000 people each year in the US suffer from a stroke. Now, majority of these 77% are first time strokes, meaning that folks have not had a stroke in the past. And the vast majority, 87% are what we call ischemic strokes. And I'll talk a little bit about the difference between ischemic strokes and hemorrhagic strokes um, in a few minutes. On average, someone has a stroke in the U.S. every 40 seconds, to put that a different way, and stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the U.S. Now, this was before 2020, um, but that's behind heart disease, cancer, chronic lower respiratory diseases, and unintentional accidents and injuries. Now, some of the good news is that up to 90% of first strokes can be prevented with risk factor modification, and that's what I'll be talking about towards the end of this talk. Now, this is a question that I try to ask every patient that I see in the hospital for a stroke. Do you know what a stroke is? Because it helps me understand what they understand. And it's not as straightforward as one might think because different people may actually mean something different when they say the word stroke. And these are various terms um, that we use or that we mean when we say the word stroke. So we'll, you know, we'll tell people, hey, you had a stroke, but it's important to be really specific about what we mean. And I'll talk about each of these different um, different phrases. So what do we mean by stroke? So first, the difference between ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. Um, so an ischemic stroke is caused by lack of blood flow to brain tissue leading to infarction, which is tissue death. Um, and usually when we say stroke, we mean ischemic stroke. Uh, so it's important to be specific about what we're actually talking about. Now a hemorrhagic stroke is what we often will call a brain bleed and it's caused by rupture of the blood vessel leading to bleeding in the surrounding brain tissue. Now a little bit more about ischemic stroke and this is the most common type of stroke. Like I said, 80% of 87% of strokes are ischemic strokes. We'll often refer to this as a blood clot in a vessel or a blocked artery. And there are several different types or causes of ischemic stroke. I'll talk briefly about the most common causes. Now this is a diagram of a normal artery um, with the arrows representing blood flowing smoothly throughout the vessel here. Now this is a blocked artery. Uh, the artery is narrowed by atherosclerosis here, which is this yellow part. So that's like fatty or cholesterol plaque. And then a blood clot gets stuck in the narrow part of the artery and causes a blockage. And then this is what leads to a stroke. 
So when an artery is blocked, either by a plaque or atherosclerosis or from a clot from somewhere else in the body, the area of the brain that's fed by that artery is what we call at risk. And that's what this is showing here, this area at risk. And this means that part of the brain, which is not getting blood, which carries oxygen and nutrients, which brain cells need to function, is at risk of dying if the blood vessel stays blocked and isn't opened. Now this picture is showing an example of an artery that's been narrowed by a plaque, like, like we just looked at, um, which is atherosclerosis, which is this yellow part here, if you can see my cursor, um, and then a blood clot stuck in the narrow part of that artery. And that's what's gonna cause the stroke. This picture shows a blood clot coming from the heart. So when a clot travels from one part of the body to another, it's called an embolus. And blood clots can form in the heart, especially in people who have an abnormal heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation, and can travel to the brain and then cause a stroke. So in this diagram, we see a blood clot from the heart that's gotten stuck in a branch point of two arteries. Now on to hemorrhagic stroke, or what we most commonly refer to as brain bleeds. This is an illustration of the most common type of cerebral hemorrhage. Here we see a blood vessel that has burst open down here, this kind of zoomed in area, which leads to re bleeding into the brain uh, and the brain tissue fed by that artery. So similar to ischemic strokes, there are multiple causes of hemorrhagic strokes. And the most common cause of hemorrhagic stroke is caused by high blood pressure. So what about TIA? And this is a concept uh, that can actually be a little bit confusing, especially in the language that we use to describe it. So TIA stands for a transient ischemic attack, so a transient episode of loss of blood flow to one area of the brain. Now, a lot of people refer to this as a mini stroke, but that can be kind of misleading. And I typically explain this as an almost stroke or a warning stroke. Um, and so, as I mentioned, it's a transient episode, so a short-lived episode of some kind of neurologic dysfunction. And we'll talk about the different types of neurologic dysfunction you can see in a stroke or a TIA that's caused by an area of ischemia or lack of blood flow to the brain most commonly, but sometimes to the eye or to the spine. That doesn't lead to any acute, acute infarction or doesn't lead to any lasting brain, uh, brain tissue death. And the reason for that is because something, the body, causes the clot to break up. So that's what we're seeing in this diagram here. Here we again see this uh, picture of the blocked artery with the atherosclerosis and the clot that's causing blood flow to not move down the artery. And then somehow the clot dissolves and then that blood flow is now flowing smoothly through the artery again. So I treat TIAs no differently than I treat a stroke, really. TIA is a sign that you're at high risk for a full-blown stroke, and um, about 12% of strokes are preceded by a TIA. So folks who have had a stroke, 12% of those people actually had a TIA prior to their stroke. And so it does suggest a significant short-term risk of stroke, and there have been lots of studies that have looked at this. In one study, 11% of patients who had a TIA uh, had a stroke within 90 days. And then 5% of patients had a stroke within two days. So the stroke risk after a TIA is really highest in the first two days and then tends to go down after that, but still stays quite high. All right, so now to the more important stuff, recognizing a stroke. So what does a stroke look like? Um, this is a picture of what a stroke might look like on an MRI, and this is a, this is a rather large stroke here. Um, but what a stroke looks like, how it presents, depend on what area of the brain is damaged. So either by ischemia, which is again, lack of blood flow, or by a bleed. Um, and then, uh, like I said, on the left is what a stroke like might look like on an MRI. And then over here is a kind of oversimplified um, diagram of different uh, functions of different parts of the brain. So as I said, it's oversimplified, but in general, each area of the brain controls a different part of the body and a different function. So this is just another diagram looking at it in a different way. So just showing that different areas of the brain and different functions that they control. So for example, the frontal lobe here um, says controls personality, reasoning, certain areas of speech or certain uh, functions of speech, and then muscle movement as well. Parietal lobe also does uh, some control of speech as well as sensation, so how we're able to sense things in the body. Uh, the temporal lobe um, also also involved in speech, so you can see a lot of speech is represented uh, in a lot of the brain. Uh, Short-term memory is often controlled on the temporal lobe, and then this back part here, the occipital lobe, controls vision. 
And then it also depends on what side of the brain is affected. And while the left brain, right brain stereotypes aren't entirely true, it is true that the right and left sides of the brain are in charge of very different functions. And we see this in strokes affecting the right versus left side of the brain. So in reality, it's a lot more complex than this. So for example, if you're speaking or calculating or doing something creative, all areas of the brain on both sides are activated. But these are the main functions that are likely to be affected in a stroke affecting one side of the brain. So the left side controls um, most of language, both spoken and written, while the right side is responsible for spatial awareness, so orienting yourself in space, as well as expressing and recognizing emotion. And both sides are responsible for these functions um, for movement, sensation, and vision. And of note, they're responsible for those functions on the opposite side of the body. So let's go back to this picture here that I showed you, this, uh, this stroke. So just to be extra confusing, in this MRI, the left side is actually the the right side and the right side is actually the left side. So this over here is showing a large stroke on the left side of the brain. So again, this imaging is kind of flipped. Um, so this person, since they have a stroke on the left side of the brain, I would expect them to have problems with language, uh, so difficulty both speaking and understanding, um, as well as problems with moving. So they probably have weakness on the right side of their body, uh, numbness on the right side of their body, and likely some problems with vision as well. So even more importantly, what's an easy way to remember how to recognize a stroke? So many people are familiar with the FAST acronym, which covers the more common or at least most recognizable symptoms of stroke. So F stands for face drooping. So you can have weakness on one side of the face. Often when you try to smile, the one side of the face won't smile with the other side. Um, arm, A stands for arm, so you can get arm weakness, you can also get leg weakness as well, but usually arm weakness on one side of the body. S stands for speech, so you can get changes in your speech, either slurring or difficulty speaking, difficulty getting your words out. And T, of course, stands for time, reminding that time is extremely important when it comes to diagnosing and treating a stroke. And so these are important to remember, but it's also important to remember that not all strokes look like this, and that's where the BFAST acronym comes in. So the BFAST acronym acronym uh, includes some lesser known stroke symptoms that are also important to remember. Um, and there was actually a study looking at this that shows um, about 14% of patients um, are captured with this particular acronym that the FAST acronym um, misses. And so what B stands for is balance. Uh, and this can include dizziness, specifically vertigo or sensation of movement or maybe spinning, and then uh, or trouble walking due to balance. And then E stands for eyesight changes, which can be loss of vision, most typically loss of ability to see one side of the world, or sometimes double vision. And then uh, the FAST portion is, is the same as what we just went over, again, emphasizing T for time uh, at the at the end there because time is extremely important, which I will say again, time is extremely important. So it's all very important to remember because um, stroke can be treated, but time matters. So time is brain is an aphorism that all of us get hammered into our heads from the time we're medical students and for a good reason. So early treatment is one of the most important factors in number one, if someone having a stroke can be treated and how well they recover after they're treated. So patients who, for example, are getting um, IV medication, so IV Alteplase, is also called IV TPA, need to be treated within four and a half hours of their symptoms starting. Um, and then patients who are having a mechanical procedure to remove a clot need to be treated usually within six hours, but sometimes out to 24 hours. Um, so these are the two main treatments that we use to treat patients with stroke. Um, and again, very time-based. So not only will it determine if you can get one of these treatments, but also how well you're going to do. So even if you're getting the treatment, the earlier you get it, the better off, uh, the better likelihood someone has of doing well after the treatment. So a little bit more about these treatments. Um, the TPA or tissue plasminogen activator, also known as Altaplase, is a clot busting medication. It's given through an IV line and it's designed to break up a clot that's blocking an artery. And I said, again, I said it needs to be given within four and a half hours of the onset of stroke symptoms to have the best chance of improving function and also to lower the risk of bleeding. 
because it is a, um, a blood thinning medication that's being given through an IV. Now, mechanical treatment is for patients who have a blockage on one of the large arteries in the brain. Um, and mechanical thrombectomy or clot retrieval is a procedure to physically remove a blood clot from a blocked artery. So a catheter is inserted into a blood vessel, usually in the leg near the groin. This is similar to a cardiac catheterization. And then it's passed through the blood vessels into the arteries feeding the brain, where the clot can then be reached and taken out. And it's important to realize that unfortunately not all strokes are treatable and not all strokes that are treated are going to improve. So it's possible that someone could still be left quite disabled even after receiving treatment. Um, and again, time is the most important thing to remember. So too often we see people who come to the hospital with symptoms of stroke who waited to see if their symptoms would get better. And when they come to the emergency department, they no longer may be eligible for one of these treatments. So now that I have hammered that uh, into your brains about time being important, we'll talk a little bit about preventing future strokes. And I'll start by uh, talking about um, preventing strokes in folks who've already had a stroke. So once someone has a stroke or a TIA, there are certain treatments that we use to try to lower the risk of a future stroke. So most patients will be started on an antiplatelet medication, uh, usually aspirin, but sometimes clopidogrel or Plavix, or possibly in both, uh, both medications in certain situations. So sometimes these are referred to as blood thinners, but they don't really thin the blood. What they do is they prevent platelets from sticking together and so prevent clots from building up and arteries from narrowing. Some patients will be started on an anticoagulant medication instead of an aspirin. And when we talk about blood thinners, these are the type of medications we're talking about. And listed here are just some of the more common ones that you may have heard of. So warfarin is a medication that's been around for a very long time. It used to be used very commonly. More often we're using some of these newer medications because they're safer and they work just as well, if not better. Um, Eliquis, lots of commercials about this. And then Xarelto is also a common one. Um, and these medications affect proteins or clotting factors in the blood that are responsible for coagulating the blood. And blood thinners are used to prevent stroke only in specific cases, such as with atrial fibrillation. So depending on the cause of the stroke, uh, many patients, probably most patients, will be started on a cholesterol medication, usually a statin. Uh, and these medications work in the liver to reduce the LDL or the bad cholesterol and can also help raise the good cholesterol as well. And patients with high blood pressure, med uh, high blood pressure need to be started on uh, blood pressure medications to keep their blood pressures on, at a normal level long term. All right, so I want to talk as well a little bit about recovery from stroke. Um, I'll touch first on the physical problems, which are the ones that we think of most common after someone's had a stroke. Um, and these are some of the more common physical problems patients may have after a stroke. So motor uh, refers to problems with strength, balance, spasticity. So strength, um, patients will often have weakness in one arm, one leg, one side of the face, or perhaps all three. And again, this occurs on the opposite side affected by the strokes. If you have a stroke on the left side of your body, your right side uh, would likely be weak. Patients can also have problems with balance, and this is either due to weakness or problems with equilibrium or dizziness. And then spasticity, what this is, is stiffness or tightness in the muscles and tendons or soft tissues around the muscle, which makes it more difficult to move the limb and may cause the limb to freeze up uh, and become painful if not treated. And speech and language problems make it difficult to communicate after a stroke. So patients may have slurred speech or dysarthria, and this is caused by difficulty controlling the muscles of the face, the tongue, or the mouth. And aphasia is a problem of language that can result from a stroke. So there are different types of aphasia that can cause either difficulty speaking. So for example, trouble getting words out or trouble finding the right words, despite knowing what you want to say, or difficulty with understanding. And patients who have large strokes can have both both of these problems. Vision uh, problems after a stroke. Uh, so strokes affecting certain parts of the brain can cause loss of vision. Most often ability to see one side of the world. So both eyes will be affected and, you, and you're unable to see the side of the world on the opposite side of your stroke. Or you can also get double vision, which happens when the two eyes are not aligned correctly and aren't moving together. 
Swallowing problems are quite common after strokes. Uh, some patients are unable to swallow regular foods due to weakness of the mouth and throat muscles or have difficulty controlling these muscles. And this causes problems because food and liquids can go kind of down the wrong tube and they can go into the lungs instead of into the stomach, which can then lead to a pneumonia. And some patients may need a special diet after a stroke or even a feeding tube that's placed directly into the stomach. And swallowing problems often improve over time. And so patients who may have needed a feeding tube after a stroke can often have it removed when they're able to eat safely again. Uh, there are other common symptoms of stroke other than physical that we tend to focus on a little bit less. So fatigue, very common after a stroke and tends to improve within a few months after the stroke but can last even after the physical problems of the stroke have improved. Memory and cognition refer to problems with memory or thinking that can be caused by a stroke. So either uh, strokes that affect parts of the brain that are responsible for memory, but can also be associated with stroke in any part of the brain. And the most common problems my patients mention are trouble with short-term memory. So for example, not remembering something a loved one said to them earlier in the day, or maybe forgetting appointments, and then difficulty focusing or concentrating, difficulty with multitasking, and trouble learning new information. Depression is also very common after a stroke and affects anywhere from a third to up to two thirds of stroke survivors. Uh, when depressive symptoms start shortly after a stroke and persist, we call this post-stroke depression. And it's very important to watch out for this and to treat it early. So these issues aren't just related to the severity of impairment after a stroke. So it's not just people who have a very large stroke and aren't able to do the things they used to do who get depressed. I often see people who have otherwise recovered physically but continue to have fatigue problems with short-term memory or concentration and low mood. And they're important to recognize these and treat them as best we can because they can affect how well someone recovers after a stroke and then also can significantly affect their quality of life. So what does recovery look like and how do we maximize recovery? And I'll start by talking about the time course of recovery or the typical time course. So this graph is from a study that looked at 32 patients who had a stroke and it looked at their recovery over the course of two years. So this um, on the um, over here is just showing a, um, a measure of functional recovery. It's called the Barthel Index. It's a tool that measures kind of functioning and day-to-day -day activity and is frequently used in studies like this to, to look at stroke recovery. And how it changes over two years is what the study was looking at. So what you see here is that the greatest recovery occurs in the first month, so four weeks, and then also significant recovery out to three months um, or 12 weeks, and then tends to flatten out a little bit after that. So this particular study also looked at other types of recovery, um, including function, improvement in arm and leg muscles, and found this same pattern for every definition of recovery that they used. So the recovery time course has to do with neuroplasticity, and that's just a way of saying our brain's ability to adjust or adapt, including after an injury like a stroke. So after a stroke, the brain's plasticity is high, meaning that's very good at adapting and reorganizing itself. And then after about three months, it returns to a more normal state. And this is not to say that someone can't continue to improve and recover after that time, but the improvement does tend to happen more slowly. So this is why it's so important in the early phase after a stroke to get rehabilitation. And there are different types of rehabilitation programs, which include physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech language therapies. And the right program for a stroke survivor will depend on the type and severity of their stroke and how much they're able to participate. So some patients will go from the hospital where they were treated for their stroke to another specialized rehabilitation hospital to get therapy for three hours a day, five days a week. And other patients may go to a skilled nursing facility if they're not able to do that much therapy or that intense of therapy. And then patients with more mild strokes may be able to go home and have therapy either in the home or in an office setting. All right, and then I'm moving on to the last portion, which is talking about risk factors and prevention. So the most important message here is that there's a lot you can actually do to prevent a stroke. So that's the point of talking about risk factors at all. And what a risk factor is, is just something that increases your chance or your risk of having a particular disease. So as I mentioned earlier on, about up to 90% of first strokes can be prevented with modification of risk factors. So what are the risk factors for stroke? 
And I'm going to focus on what we call modifiable risk factors. Then these are the factors that you can potentially do something about. So some risk factors for stroke, like older age and genetics or family history, are out of our control. And while it's important to know about those so we have a better idea of our individual risk, I'd like to focus on what we can control. Um, so high blood pressure, um, especially prolonged over time, is a very big risk factor for stroke. And a normal blood pressure is um, 130 over 80. So anything that's higher than that um, is considered uh, high blood pressure, hypertension. Diabetes is also another very common medical problem that's a risk factor for stroke. And certain abnormal heart rhythms, particularly atrial fibrillation. The risk of this increases with age. And so it's not necessarily something that you can change. If you have it, you have it. But there are particular treatments, especially for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. And so it's important to know if you have it because we do treat it differently than strokes from other causes. Um, high cholesterol, also very common. Um, and high LDL, which is what we generally consider the bad cholesterol, predisposes to stroke. And so depending on your other risk factors, um, and some patients will recommend diet and lifestyle change, while in patients who are at high risk for cardiovascular disease would likely recommend a statin, which is a cholesterol-lowering medication. Uh, smoking increases your risk of stroke two to four times, and even secondhand smoke can increase stroke risk by 25%. Um, sedentary lifestyle or physical inactivity is a risk factor for stroke, and several studies have shown a protective effect of physical activity. Uh, sleep apnea is a very common medical problem and has been shown to be an independent risk factor for stroke. So again, it's important to treat it if you have it. Kidney disease can increase your risk of stroke anywhere from five to 30 times um, compared to a patient without kidney disease or cr typically chronic kidney disease. And heavy alcohol use can be associated with intracerebral hemorrhage and then many other health, health problems that can um, increase stroke risk. Some studies have shown that the risk of stroke is actually higher in patients who drink no alcohol versus low alcohol intake. Although the guidelines make sure to point out that this does not mean that patients should be encouraged to start drinking if they don't drink alcohol already, but it's important to drink in moderation if you do drink. So to recap things that you can do other than managing health issues like high blood pressure or diabetes as well as other health problems that are associated with stroke there are uh, these are very simple things that you can do to help decrease your risk of having a stroke and i guess i shouldn't say that stopping smoking is simple because i know it's extremely difficult um, but again very very big risk factor for smoke uh, for for stroke and so smoking a cessation is effective in reducing stroke risk so if you're a smoker um, it's helpful to get help from your primary care doctor or other resources in the community to try to help you quit smoking um, if you drink alcohol, it's best to drink in moderation. Heavy drinking can increase your risk of stroke, as I mentioned. Uh, so again, important to do it in moderation. Diet. Um, a diet that includes a lot of fruits and vegetables may help reduce risk of stroke. There are diets that um, are sometimes recommended, such as the DASH diet, um, which focuses on reducing sodium intake. And then the Mediterranean diet is one that a lot of people have heard about. These may be protective against stroke, but kind of the main thing is that these diets emphasize lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, fish, legumes like beans, white meat, low sodium, that sort of thing. Um, I think the, the um, finding across a lot of studies is that fruits and vegetables um, are a good, a good way to incorporate into your diet to reduce your risk of stroke. And then moving just a little bit every day. So even a little bit of exercise, like a brisk walk or even yard work, improves your health and may reduce your risk of stroke. The typical recommendation is to do some degree of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic exercise for at least 30 minutes a day, three to four times a week. And so with I, my patients, I emphasize any form of movement that they enjoy. So you don't need to go to the gym every day or run on the treadmill to get the benefits of movement. It's really just about finding something that you enjoy that gets you moving because that's what you're going to be motivated to do. And physical activity has a lot of other benefits for your heart, your brain, and your overall mood and well-being. So important to find some movement that is uh, enjoyable for you. And then I'll end just by pointing out some resources if you'd like to learn more. The American Stroke Association website is a wonderful resource. Um, they have a stroke informational page that has a lot of brochures. It's actually where I took some of the images from my talk today. Um, very, uh, very useful. There's a Stroke Connection magazine, which is a free digital magazine for stroke survivors and their families and caregivers. Um, there is a 
uh, Stroke Support Network, which is a virtual community for stroke and heart disease survivors, as well as a national registry um, for, uh, for stroke support groups. All right, so with that, I am happy to ask any questions or answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you, Dr. Haight. No that problem. was an amazing presentation. I have some pages of notes here in okay. front of me that I was jotting down as you were sharing. And I thank you for keeping it simple for me and uh, I hope others too. I um, appreciated those definitions. I really love that. Do you know what a stroke is? slide, mm -hmm. how you listed them all out, because I feel like I'm hearing them more and more. I, I know that we're in the month of May where it's Stroke Awareness Month, and we're probably hearing this a little bit more than usual, but it's good to have those de de uh, definitions for us laid out right there. So thank you for that. So we do um, uh, have some preloaded questions that we um, want to share with the uh, with you, um, and then we are going to you know grab some questions from that Facebook page of ours in the comment right. section. So we um, have some questions. So one of the first ones that we have is um, stroke symptoms seem to have a sudden onset. I know you mentioned that there were some precursors that could be that warning sign, but some seem to have that sudden onset. Onset. Can you review what symptoms should what symptoms you should look for that are unique for stroke? Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And I can um, bring up my slide again. I think y'all are seeing my slide here um, with the acronym FAST. So, like you said, stroke symptoms do tend to come on all of a sudden. So, one second you're doing fine, and the next second, bam, you have these symptoms that weren't there before. And actually, a lot of my patients say you know, I felt fine. I didn't feel like I was having a stroke. I didn't know that I was going to have one. And it's like, exactly. That's the point. You don't know that it's coming, which is, which is scary. And so, um, uh, the things to look out for, again, I'll go over these common ones with a FAST acronym. So either drooping of the face, you may know you ask someone to smile and it's either both sides of their face going up. One might kind of stay down like this, um, arm weakness. So often we can ask people to raise up their arms and you really can't see me here, but one may kind of fall down or not be able to raise it. Um, leg weakness as well can be a stroke and then difficulty with speech. So either slurring their speech. Sometimes they say, Oh, well, you know, my, I was talking to my wife and she thought I was drunk or, you know, just like knowing what you want to say, but just not being able to get the words out. So either of those can be uh, signs of a stroke. Um, and then let's see if I can bring up my next slide that I had showed you guys. So the other two to remember less common, but still important to look out for are the issues with balance. So not being able to walk right, um, kind of just feeling unsteady, um, and then eyesight changes. So either complete loss of vision. And I mentioned that this is usually in both eyes, one side of the world. It can also just be in one eye. So if you have loss of vision in just one eye, that can be a sign of a stroke um, or double vision. So suddenly you're seeing one of things, um, and then the next second you're seeing two of things. That can be a sign of a stroke as well. Okay. Yeah, great. That, you know, I haven't seen that be fast. Mm -hmm. a whole lot. So I'm glad that you, you had that in your presentation as well. And, and, and just if we could, before we go to our next question is with the arm or leg weakness, is there a specific side that I should be looking for? Like if my right arm or my left arm goes um, numb, is that an immediate sign or can it be either arm or it leg? Be, yeah, it can be either arm or leg, um, usually one. So usually if you have something on both sides, it's usually not um, a stroke. But of course, if you're suddenly weak in both arms, that's also something to be alarmed about. But typically it's one side or the other um, and and doesn't matter which side. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. This is a great question, too, as um, we're hearing more about high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, so does having high blood pressure put you at a greater risk for stroke? Yeah, it absolutely does. And in a couple different ways. So I think as I mentioned before, it puts you at higher risk for not only ischemic stroke, which is the blood clot kind of stroke, but also for a bleeding type stroke. So I'll talk about the ischemic stroke first, since like I said, it's the most common. Mm -hmm. So um, as you have long blood, high blood pressure, especially for a long period of time, so um, long standing high blood pressure for many years that's untreated, it can cause damage to the arteries, particularly the arteries, um, smaller arteries that feed the kind of middle or deeper parts of the brain can become kind of weakened over time and it can all of a sudden either um, close off suddenly and cause a stroke 
or they can burst suddenly, like uh, I had talked about earlier, it can cause a bleeding type stroke. So it increases your risk of both of those types of strokes. Um, I know I just said I was going to talk about ischemic stroke first, but it, in it increases your risk of both of those types of stroke for kind of a similar reason. It causes damage to the arteries over time. And then hypertension or high blood pressure can also increase your risk of stroke by promoting atherosclerosis or plaque formation in the arteries. And that can lead to a stroke if either you have narrowing of the artery, any arteries, so not just the small ones in the brain, but any arteries in the chest, in the neck, in the head um, can be narrowed caused by plaque formation. Um, with uh, hypertension or high blood pressure is a risk factor for that um, and can also um, cause a piece of a plaque to break off and go somewhere else to the brain. So a couple different ways that high blood pressure can lead to stroke. Wow. Yeah. It, it is, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. it is. It <laughs> it's is. all connected. Yeah. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you touched on um, recovery, that there is hope after stroke mm -hmm. and, you know, time is brain and, to, you know, making sure that we get um, your, your loved one here, someone that you see having a stroke calling 911. Um, can you sustain permanent brain damage from a stroke? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually a fantastic question. Um, and it's actually one I get a lot. So folks will ask, um, will that part of the brain come back or does it heal? And what a, what a stroke is that it is permanent brain damage. And so mm -hmm. that's why it is so important that if we can treat it, we should. So what happens is that the, you know, we'll start with ischemic stroke. When you have blockage of blood flow, that area of the brain, those brain cells are no longer getting nutrients. They're no longer getting um, um, oxygen. And so those tissue, that tissue dies, those brain cells die if they're not you know, if the brain, if the blood flow isn't restored. Mm -hmm. um, and so that part of the tissue is gone. It does not come back. What happens when people recover is that the brain tissue around it kind of picks up the slack. And that was what I was talking to with the neuroplasticity is yeah. that the brain kind of learns and reorganizes itself and picks up the slack for that area that is, that is um, gone. And that's why people can recover. But it does cause permanent brain damage to that one area of the brain, not the entire brain, but just that one area that was damaged and it does not recover. It does not come back. It's the rest of the brain that kind of picks up the slack and, and, and makes up for it. Well, it's like a lot of teamwork going on exactly. in the brain <laughs> exactly. to help that one area, all hands on deck there. So, oh, that's nice. Thank you. Okay. So, Oh yeah, this is this is a terrific question too. Um, and I, I don't think I've um, this one has even crossed my mind. So, is, so what in your share? So, is it true that you may sustain personality changes and mood swings following a stroke? And if so, how long do these conditions last? Oh, that is a good question. It's not. <laughs> I, I touched on it a little bit, but not directly that question. Um, so, it is true that you can get personality changes, maybe mood swings after a stroke, and that can be for a couple different reasons. So, actually, I let me bring up this picture I showed here. Which I actually didn't think. Uh, hold on one sec. I've got to figure out how to share it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Um, all right. So um, this area in the frontal lobe here, you see it says controls personality. So if you have a stroke in a certain area that is responsible for personality or maybe how you express yourself, that can then kind of directly lead to personality changes. Um, so that can certainly happen from a stroke. And that recovers, I would say, similar to how um, other things recover. So if you have speech problems from a stroke, that's going to recover gradually over time, may not get to 100%, and actually it often doesn't get to 100%. Um, so it's possible you could have some residual changes after a stroke, but we really see that bulk of improvement in the first in the first um, three months there, and then gradually after that. So that's one way that a stroke can cause personality changes. Um, the mood swings part of it, I actually thought about including this in my talk, but I didn't. Sometimes strokes in certain places in the frontal lobes sometimes in the um, in the brain stem or in the deeper portions of the brain can cause something called pseudobulbar affect. And it's a fancy way of saying kind of just random uh, emotional outbursts. And so it can seem like the person suddenly starts crying or suddenly starts laughing and, and it may can, can be very off-putting for, for patients because they don't necessarily feel like crying or feel like laughing. It's just a kind of neurologic response. And so that can happen as well. Um, and again, tends to improve gradually over time. So those are two ways that a 
stroke can directly cause those types of problems. Mm -hmm. Now, um, another important thing to remember um, is that stroke is very highly associated with depression. And so <laughs> Um, someone may have personality changes or mood changes or, or um, mood swings because of, because of depression. And depression presents differently in different people. Um, so, for example, people don't always say, I'm sad, you know, I'm crying all the time, I feel down. They may be irritable. Um, they may have a short fuse. They may, you know, just not feel like doing anything. They may feel tired. So there are lots of different ways that, um, that depression can present and can cause um, significant problems and what might be perceived as personality changes and certainly mood swings. Um, and that, you know, fortunately is very treatable with either therapy, medications, often a combination of the two. Um, and so, you know, how long that lasts depending, you know, kind of depends on how quickly you pick up on it and um, are we able to treat it adequately. Wow, that, thank you. I'm so grateful somebody asked that question because I haven't had that before. So thank you for explaining it so well. Um, okay, so in the beginning you said pre-COVID, um, stroke is the fifth leading cause of death mm -hmm. for it. That's just mind boggling. And mm -hmm. the most common stroke is the ischemic stroke with like 87% of those um, strokes coming in are ischemic. Yep. So if, a person has a stroke in the past, does this put my children at a higher risk of stroke or the next generation of like the grandchildren? Mm -hmm. Well, that is a good question. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated question, actually, or a complicated answer, because it's essentially asking, you know, do strokes, can strokes or stroke risk run in families? And that's certainly true in a couple different ways. So there are stroke rare causes of stroke that run in families and that can be genetic. And I'm not going to talk about those because those are quite rare. Um, but it's really about the risk factors for stroke and are you predisposed to stroke and can those things run in families or be passed down? And the answer to that is that to that is yes. So for example, type 2 diabetes, um, you know, it's what we consider kind of like a lifestyle disease, right? So, you know, associated with, um, you know, lifestyle decisions, that sort of thing, eating a lot of carbs, eating a lot of sugar. But it's actually quite it run it does run in families and so if you have a high fair a heavy family history of diabetes you're going to be at higher risk for diabetes yourself and so you know that was a little bit of what i was alluding to with the um you know risk factors that can, we can control versus ones that we can't um, we can certainly control a little bit our risk of diabetes or high blood pressure but you know some people it just runs in their family and they're going to be at high risk for it regardless so you know stroke mm -hmm. can you know if you have a stroke it can doesn't necessarily put your future generations at risk, but it could be a signal that okay, look, I'm I'm at higher risk for that, um, and those types of risk factors may run in families. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and when you were just sharing, too, I was thinking about that slide that you had up um, about the four steps, like just stuff that we can do to help prevent it, and mm -hmm. you know, our family members stop smoking, mm -hmm. drinking in moderation eating fruits and vegetables and moving more every day. It, it's, it's like simple, but it is, it's, it's tough. Simple, but challenging. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, simple, but challenging. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So it looks like we got a question um, from our uh, Facebook viewing audience okay. um, over here. Oh, this, this is a terrific question too. So are young adults suspect, susceptible? I always have trouble with that word. <laughs> <a> stroke. <laughs> what could make people in their 20s or 30s who are otherwise healthy to be susceptible to stroke? And correct me, I always have trouble yeah. with that word. Yeah. So, you know, young adults uh, are absolutely susceptible to stroke. And, you know, if you're someone who's otherwise healthy, no, no health problems, I mean, certainly younger folks can have things like high blood pressure, diabetes, that sort of stuff, um, or could be smokers, you know, things that increase risk. Um, there are certain types of stroke that can occur in people who are are otherwise healthy. So um, a big one is um, something called an artery dissection. Um, actually, it would have been useful if I put that in here. So what an artery dissection is, it's a tear in the wall of the blood vessel. And so what can happen is that you get a tear in the wall of the blood vessel. And this can happen kind of randomly, spontaneously, or sometimes can be brought on by, by trauma. Uh, so for a car accident, if you like jerk your neck real rapidly or something like that, it can cause injury to the artery. 
tear in the blood vessel and then blood instead of flowing through the through the artery like it normally does can kind of get under the wall of the blood vessel and it can either cause a clot to form that can then break off and go into the brain and cause a stroke or it can cause the artery to narrow which then blocks the artery and then can cause a stroke that way. So that's probably one of the more common causes of stroke in young adults. And that can, again, happen randomly and just normal healthy people or people who have a problem with their blood vessels that, you know, is otherwise asymptomatic or not causing them any problems. So, you know, something that they've had forever, uh, they just, you know, it's not been causing them any problems. So they don't necessarily know that they have it, but then something like this can come up where the blood vessel itself is susceptible to injury and can cause something like a dissection from happening. Um, other, I would say more rare causes, um, I mentioned that certain cardiac or heart conditions can increase the risk of stroke. Most common one would be atrial fibrillation, which is an abnormal heart rhythm that can cause clots to form in the heart and then can go to the brain. Young people tend to have that less, but really any kind of, uh, not any kind, but other kinds of heart problems can cause, um, can cause strokes as well. Um, so let's see, for example, and like a structural heart problem that, again, you may not know that you have because it wasn't causing you any problems um, could could lead to a stroke. I think that's less common because I think if there's a heart problem that's severe enough to lead to a stroke, you probably probably know about it. So I think that's a less common cause, um, but certainly a possibility. Mm -hmm. So whenever someone with a young person comes in who had a stroke, we look for kind of the unusual or strange causes. So we'll look for other things like autoimmune disease, rheumatologic disease. So things like lupus can very rarely cause a stroke. Uh, we'll look for any disorders that uh, can just predispose the blood to clotting that could cause strokes to form that sort of thing. So um, again, the biggest the biggest um, cause of stroke in young people would be an artery dissection or damage to an artery. And then these other things are much, much more rare. Got it. And, and so in that same vein, do you think one gender, male or female, tends to have strokes more? Ooh, I wish I, really? <laughs> Just I, sh I should have the data on that, but I don't. <laughs> um, but but male, men and women are certainly at risk for strokes for different reasons. Um, so um, actually, uh, another thing in, in younger folks is that the um, era or the time period around pregnancy is actually a relatively high um, uh, risk period for stroke, for bleeding strokes, and for and for um, ischemic strokes. Um, so women have that risk factor that that men don't have. Um, and uh, but in terms of who has more strokes. <sighs> I don't have a great answer for that. I mean, I do think that men tend to be at higher risk for things like cardiovascular disease, but I, I think that that's not even necessarily, um, you know, I think not necessarily um, true. I don't think you should feel like protected from being, you know, because you're one gender or the other. Um, right. Yeah, but yeah. certainly different risk factors. Yeah, 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 different risk factors. And yeah, and you know, if people uh, are viewing audience, if you're interested in seeing some more of these um, risk factors, we have them on our vcuhealth.org slash stroke right there at the bottom of our screen. And you can see more um, information on there that uh, Dr. Taylor Haight um, kindly shared with us this afternoon. And, um, you know, I want to see if I got this right with B fast. So B is balance, mm -hmm. E is eyesight. Mm -hmm. T, uh, oh, sorry, fast. So F is face, mm -hmm. A is arm, mm -hmm. S is speech, and then T is time. Yep. Be fast. Exactly. Very good. So, yep. Dr. Perfect. Taylor Haight, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And thank you to our viewing audience for uh, tuning in to watch this very timely discussion about stroke and the uh, recovery of stroke. Um, so thank you for joining us. You can catch this online and uh, watch the recording again. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone. Bye-bye.